When most people talk about the brain, they are actually referring to the top layer, called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is recognizable by its many wrinkles, called fissures. And these fissures serve a purpose by increasing the surface area of your brain. Put it this way, if we didn't have fissures, our heads would be the size of a, I don't know, uh, an extra large pizza to hold all of the neural connections that we have. The cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres, the left and the right. In general, the left hemisphere deals with the right half of the body, and the right hemisphere controls the left. This concept is called contralateral control. Some researchers believe that if you are a righty, in other words, you have a stronger left hemisphere, you are more logical and strong in sequential tasks like math. And if you're a lefty, or you have a stronger right hemisphere, you tend to be more creative. But these are really generalizations, and the research is, you know, kind of inconclusive. Connecting the two hemispheres is a band of fibers called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum enables the right and left hemisphere to communicate with each other. There are rare cases where surgeons will remove the corpus callosum usually in epileptic patients to help with their seizures. These patients are then called split brain patients because they have two hemispheres that cannot communicate with each other. It's very difficult to conceptualize, but it's kind of like having two brains inside of one head. The left and right hemispheres could be thinking or doing totally different things. I mean, split brain patients can function totally fine in society but they do have language and some visual issues. The cerebral cortex is broken up into four lobes. I mean, I guess technically it's eight lobes if you count that each lobe does have a right and left side to it. The first set of lobes are called the frontal lobes and they're located right behind our eyes. The frontal lobe plays a huge part in what separates us from other animals. It deals with our personality, our emotional control, our abstract thought, and our ability to think and plan ahead. For most people, in the left frontal lobe, they have a zone of neurons called Broca's area. Broca's area is responsible for the movements you make with your mouth while talking. Broca kind of sounds like boca to me, which is Spanish for mouth, so I don't know, that might help. If you damage Broca's area from an accident or a stroke, it's called Broca's aphasia, and you'll have difficulty speaking. In the rear part of the frontal lobe, you have the motor cortex. This portion of the brain is responsible for controlling our voluntary muscles. Now, if you remember the concept of contralateral control, the left motor cortex controls the right side of our body, and the right motor cortex controls the left side of our body. But just to make things a bit more confusing, the top of the motor cortex controls the bottom of our body, like our legs and our feet, and the bottom of the motor cortex controls the top of our body, like our head and our neck. The next lobe in the cerebral cortex is located at the top of our head, and it's called the parietal lobe. It contains the somasensory cortex, which receives and interprets touch sensation from the body. It is laid out the same way as the motor cortex. The top controls the bottom, the bottom controls the top, the left controls the right, the right controls the left. Also in our parietal lobe is the angular gyrus. This structure is also involved in complex language comprehension and numerical interpretation. People with damage to the angular gyrus usually have a lot of problems with arithmetic. But then again, who doesn't? Math is just stupid. I'm actually only saying that because I can't really do it. Okay, whatever. Um, in the back of our brain, we have the uh, occipital lobes. These lobes interpret vision from our eyes in an area called the visual cortex. They also contain cells called feature detectors. These are cells that assist us in seeing the specifics of an object, like its shape or, or color or motion. Uh, for example, there are cases where humans are born without the feature detectors for motion. Uh, they don't have them in their visual cortex. Therefore, they actually do not see movement. I'm not really sure what they see. Uh, my best guess is something like, I don't know, like a strobe effect from a, from a nightclub.
Not that I go to many of those. The final lobes are called the temporal lobes and are located on the sides of our head, right above our ears. They help us interpret sound waves that are processed by the cochlea in our ears. An important structure in the temporal lobe is called Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area helps us interpret both the written and spoken speech. If you experience damage to Wernicke's area, it's often called Wernicke's aphasia, and that person would have issues with word order, or, I don't know, grammar, or just understanding what they hear or they read. These are the basic structures you will need to know for most introductory psychology courses. But they're not really set in stone. The structures can actually alter or change over time because of the environment. This process is known as brain plasticity. If some part of the brain is damaged, it can neurally reroute itself and move the process to an undamaged area. As you get older, your brain becomes less plastic. So an adult that suffers brain damage, it's way less likely to recover than somebody much, much younger. So, I don't know, the depressing lesson to that is, if you're gonna suffer some catastrophic brain damage, do it when you're younger. <laughs>